So now let us begin with session two. The agenda for session two is humans, AI, and robots, a new paradigm for collaboration and coexistence. And we have three presenters here with us to solve the problems that fa face humanity in the topic in more depth. So now allow me to introduce the first presenter of session two. Our first presenter is Dr. Sing Chul Lee. He is the director of the Indo-Korea Science and Technology Center at the Korea Institute of Science and Technology. His presentation is titled, Machine Learning Techniques for Science and Engineering, a focused study on material science. So let's give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sung Chul Lee from IKST in Bangalore, uh, from Korea Institute of Science and Technology. Because the simultaneous interpretation is available, I will speak in Korean from now on. Thank you. Uh, Before starting, work. Just uh, <laughs> one. <laughs> 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 it's not that I'm very fluent in English, but okay. So. In terms of science and technology, there are many methodologies to do research, and I believe there is a huge impact when there are new methodologies. For instance, the 2023 Physics Nobel Prize wa was given to Atochopolis, which in the past was a field that was not accessible. So now we are able to understand more of that area and that impact is beyond our imagination. So I would like to tell you a story. I believe that AI has even a greater impact and also has an impact, impact on the research area as well. And that is why, because of those realistic aspects, I would like to briefly mention about the importance of AI, and especially because AI, when it comes to material science, how it is being utilized in material science, I would like to tell you a couple of stories of how it's being utilized. So while preparing for this presentation, I was thinking, So I started my research in 1993, and back then most of the professors were doing research and some were doing calculation, calibration, science. And I thought back then, so when I touch something, I usually break something. So I was wondering if I could really do material science. But then I started to use the computer to do research. And in the past, most of the researches were done just to do experiments. But, but then I had the 486 DOS computer, the MS-DOS computer. So I used this computer, and it was not linked to the network. I just had the hard disk drive. And with that, I started my research. And now 30 decades have passed. And this is our India Center Research Center. So it looks like just a regular office. And you can see there are these partitions here, and within the partitions there are desks. This is the office. There are desks and monitors. But then inside you can see we have the cable network, the fiber network, and also a lot of program languages and softwares are used to do the calibration and calculation. So when we say calculation science, it means to use the computer to look into the physical phenomenon, to do the interpretation. And at our center, most of our researchers, they use their own computers to do their own work. And so to use the computer, what is important is to have the network. And as you can see, we are located in Bangalore, India. and through the high speed network we do the communication is possible and there are no limitations and we have a lot of research talents from india to carry out the r and d activities and for those of you who might have the opportunity to visit us let us know because especially bengaluru in india is a high tech city and many indians they say that there are two parts of india there is bengaluru and others and that is why it's such a high tech city so if you have the opportunity to visit us let us know and so this is how we do research so we can also do remote research and then there are also those because i said we are in bengaluru but there's then there's also mumbai kolkata there are other researchers located in other parts of india carrying out ai activities so we are material scientists 
So we don't really develop AI itself, but we use the AI technologies to design the materials. That is what we do. So the dream of a material scientist is very simple. It is, for instance, for me, when I started doing research on material science, I thought that I would develop a new material. That was my dream. And in order to make that dream come true, you have to go through a lot of trials and errors. You need to have a lot of insights to develop something. And there weren't any other methods to develop a new material. But now with the emergence of AI, I personally believe that my dream, I am one step further from achieving my dream. So these are the research areas that I currently do. They are too specific. That is why I will just briefly go through the areas. So there are application sciences and also with what kind of materials, with what kind of calibration software we use to do the calculation. And so here you can see the third part. So let's say we have this specific material and then we do the calculation, the calibration, and then we do the prediction of the properties. Then we do the experiments with the relative parties. So we need to so we weren't able to develop the materials that we really need, but now with big data and through machine learning, we are able to screen the materials first. And with that material that we've already screened, we use simulation and to see what properties that material has and we can provide it to those who do the experiment and then they can do the experiment with confidence. And so, we do a lot of co-research with those who do the experiments and we, because we don't really know, they will do the synthesis analysis not knowing what kind of properties those materials will show. But if there's any theory or any methodology and we can do some prediction, then they can have a higher level of confidence in doing the experiment. If not, then they will say, okay, maybe this doesn't work. We should quit. It's not like that anymore. We have this motivation to continue that experiment because we know we have done the prediction. So in the past, all the experiments were done in this way. Just to make it briefly, there is the hypothesis and maybe this could be an insight or this could be just a accidental hypothesis and we just do some synthesis with a certain material and then we will be analyzing the properties and then we go back. So we do this process on and on again and by doing so we need time, people and budget. However, with the use of high-tech technologies, this looks a little bit more complex complicated, but it's actually not. Because now if we include these high-tech technologies, then we can more easily, more fastly, more efficiently develop new materials. So this is the simulation. We have the data. And so there are any candidate materials. So it's not just going to be a simple hypothesis, but it will be about knowing the properties of those materials. So we can do the prediction and we can analyze those predictions and then we can do the validations and by doing so we can develop the material much faster and there are many researchers going on this, this field. It looks complicated however this is our work that we do and this is like part of our work. So there are those who do the experiments, they do the synthesis and if there are any problems arising from a synthesis then we will analyze it, we will propose any new materials, we give the feedback and then they are able to, we are able to find new materials more quickly. And so the advantages when developing new materials is so we've been using the materials, let's say if it's metal or silicon, we know those the properties of those materials. That is why we're using them to the very best extent. But moving forward, there will be other materials. We need to develop other materials that we can use to its fullest. And so to do so. And it's actually difficult to apply those materials every time. And that is why developing new materials requires, so to do so, the new materials we believe that will be able to perform to its fullest level. And this slide, well, there aren't many numbers here, but this is just a keyword about AI. So when we do the search on AI and so since after 2011, you can see that the search on AI increases rapidly.
So before then, it wasn't that much. So re recently, the search and papers on AI have increased dramatically, which means that AI, because we are receiving a lot of help through AI, there's a lot of research going on with AI. And you can also see that there are many papers published with a about AI. So there is there are papers about density functional theories and so on. So you can see that m there are more and more papers being published after 2010. So in the past, I thought that AI maybe is just a temporary thing. It will go away. That is what I thought in the past. So, but now because we understand that this is a powerful tool, that there is a new research methodology, and that is why we can use AI to do and develop new materials. So for those of you who are not really familiar with material science, well, material science is a very professional field. So like, it's about having, in the past, it's about having this empirical science or doing empirical science. But then the second paradigm is that had to have a model and to have a theory based on that model. But these researches were mostly very simple. But then after the 1950s, with the development of computers, then a lot of computation and calculations were able to be done. And so the material design and interpretation were all enabled through computational power and then in the fourth paradigm we can use big data which is all that data that is accumulated by humanity will be actively utilized and all those past experiences will be included to develop new materials so this is the fourth paradigm of material science and in that case all those past experiences will be turned into data and we can create new data. So this is a new methodology where AI can play a critical part. So this is another example. So then how will this take place? So first, let's say if we need a hydrogen storage, then these days, If we say we, in the past, when we did it based on experiences and literature, now we will learn about the chemical properties related to hydrogen and what are the key factors required. And then based on that, we will develop an auto encoder and create the data and do the prediction. And so after doing the prediction, through the neural network or through other kinds of networks, we will because we have about 1,000 to 10,000 materials that are screened. So we will do the screening of the materials and then come up with the best suitable outcome. And then through computation, we will do the training and testing. And then there will be a lot of trials and errors that we can reduce. And in that process, we can continue modifying those key factors. And that is why when developing new materials, the cycle itself will be curtailed very much and we are able to get reliable results. So now what are we doing at the Korea or the India KIST? So in the past when we did only computation, now we do machine learning, deep learning, and also natural language processing. So when we say photovoltaic material, there are many types of materials. And when we say do the synthesis of all materials, then it's difficult to do. So first we have to find the key factors. For instance, what value or what kind of material is good for this photovoltaics. So it's not that we will try to look at all materials, but we will through machine learning, tell the system what to do and we will get a formula and then based on that we can get the most optimal outcomes and results and we will have a predicted material which is gallium boron phosphide which is ABX2 from the ABX2 system so we have designed this and we have propose it to those who do the experiments saying that these have good properties so let's do the research together and that is why we are conducting the research together and by doing so in that process we are able to secure a vast amount of data and those who are doing the experiment they can do the synthesis based on confidence they know that this will work 
and we can focus on the research and do the development. And another example is using machine learning. So these days we say that energy materials are important. Let's say catalysts are important. And so what kind of reactions there is because these are all chemical reactions. And so in our case, what we do is so most of the molecules, we look at the energy of the molecules and then we do the training and testing. And so the results of the theories and the results coming out of machine learning. And we will do the comparison whether there is a linear relationship. And this will be used to do the actual training and testing. And when using the catalyst and when we design the reactions, we can use these results and get reliable results as well. And so this is used a lot. And based on this data, we can design new catalysts and we can also design new reactions. And so in terms of deep learning, do you know what crystalline materials are? So crystalline is the combination of atoms and atoms. And so what we've done is to apply it to nodes and to see how the atoms are combined. And so we have this sort of crystal graph and we have done the uh, system to do the learning. And so the reliability level was about 95%, meaning that the prediction level is was quite high. So this is just the starting point. And then we have to pursue other materials that have the similar characteristics. So by doing so, when we use big data, we can predict all crystalline materials properties. So we can have this kind of a system in place. But if we quit here, then for our, for us scientists, if the computer does everything, then what can we do? What is our role? So we might be complaining. So then what we thought is that So considering all of this, we can get better results. That's what we understood. And Sorry. So we can expand this model to all crystalline materials and to have a better understanding of the crystalline materials. So all the knowledge that we had, plus having the help of deep learning, then we can get more accurate, more broader prediction models and come up with better data and codes. And so there's a lot of research going on here as well. So if there is a atom, then we need to know the characteristic of that atom. And then for those who do the experiment, they can do the synthesis. And then we can design the new material, develop the new material. This is our ultimate goal, what we want to do. And next, this is about the natural language processing. So we did this because for papers, there is a sort of pattern and through natural language processing, we can understand the pattern and understand the papers itself. So the chat GPT is doing a great work and all the presenters before said that domain knowledge is very important, but text mining without domain knowledge is meaningless. So we need to utilize our domain knowledge to extract the necessary information and by doing so, we can use that intellectual data and assets. And so automated tools were developed by our staff in India. And the challenges that we face is that we can work on the text, but what about graphics? But now with the emergence of multimodal model, now we can not only work with data, we can expand to images. And through images and text, we can efficiently use the research data of the past. So the reason why we were able to utilize machine learning is because I was using computers since 30 years ago. 
and also there are others who just focus on experiments and they didn't really use much of the computers and so they're not really familiar with using computers but for me at least the researchers at KIST and those who are not familiar with using computers I've been thinking about how they can utilize the AI technologies in a graphic environment and so we are creating a platform for them and so here it is important Let's say if we want to synthesize a new material, it's important not only to have a model, but it's also important to have an infrastructure, to have the data to do the knowledge sharing. And all that data, if it is all integrated, then ultimately we can synthesize new material or develop new materials that we want to do. And all of this will be realized through data. And if this is included in our platform that we are going to make, then those who do the experiments, they can use this platform like just an app without any barriers, easily, simply. And I think because I've been conducting research, I believe that I have more domain knowledge. So because of that, I can find ways for researchers to use this platform more efficiently. And this is what we are currently doing. It's about creating a platform and including machine learning and also having a database and eventually to develop materials and make sure that the those who do the experiments, they can do the experiments easily, they can collect the data easily, and they can extract the existing data so that they get their desirable results and do the appropriate computation, calculation, do the experiment. So this is not a promotion or advertisement, but I'm just telling that because we are developing this platform, in terms of science and technology methodology, I believe that there will be an inno innovative methodology. And this is the UI that I created. So maybe you might think this looks really like an engineer, like of a graph. It doesn't look beautiful, but I will try to add on so that I can create a beautiful interface. So this is the level of my imagination. I do not have any artistic taste yet. And if possible, a lot of graphics, data modules, because they are already included in there, I would like to make sure that the users can use this platform in a more comprehensive way. And other than that, these are the codes that we developed, and there are AI methodologies that we would like to integrate. So in our graphic environment, so that people can use all of this for their research purposes. That will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Another big round of applause, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for the thought-provoking presentation. You may return to your seat. Thank you very much. So our next presenter for session two is Dr. Praveen Pankajaksan, the head of the Kropin AI lab in India. Dr. Pankajaksan will talk about geospatial foundational AI for sustainable and regenerative agriculture. So ladies and gentlemen, please give him a big round of applause. Uh, Dr. Pankajakchan, if you're ready, the floor is yours, so you may begin it whenever you want to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, please let me know if I'm audible. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thank you. This is, uh, this is wonderful to be here. Uh, I thank uh, both uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Yuan uh, for this invitation um, and also uh, the forum uh, which is convened here today. Uh, really a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for listening in as well. Um, first of all, I'll just start by introducing myself. Uh, so my name is Praveen Pankajakshan. Um, so uh, I hope my slides are visible also, like uh, uh, if it's not, please do let me know. 
Um, so very briefly, I uh, am part of Cropin, uh, a startup uh, based out of Bangalore. Uh, so Dr. Lee talked about how there is Bangalore and the rest of India. I can uh, say that I'm, I'm not from Bangalore, but I can definitely say that that a lot of people do resonate with that idea. Uh, so I lead the crop in AI labs. Uh, so I'm the VP data science and AI. Um, and uh, I do also have a joint app appointment. Uh, I am visiting faculty in Amrita University uh, in Kerala and uh, also uh, teaching and guiding PhD students. And I'm also the uh, committee advisor in Harvard, uh, the Harvard Data Science uh, Initiative as well. Um, in my past role, I can really resonate with what Dr. Lee talked about material science. I see some of my friends there in his uh, slides. Uh, Dr. Umesh Vagmare, for example, very fantastic scientist uh, based out of Bangalore. So those who are visiting Bangalore and interested in material science, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, I would really encourage uh, to also talk to him as well. I have uh, one publication with him also, incidentally, on material science and application for AI. Um, and uh, But that's not on big data, but small data. Uh, and I come from machine learning uh, and application in multiple areas. So materials, I had been working in the past. Uh, but this talk will be more on our regenerative agriculture and climate smart agriculture, especially using geospatial AI. So I'll be really quick uh, because I know that we have a short period of time and I have much slides to cover as well. Um, I'll just very briefly introduce about Cropin. Um, you know, Cropin is uh, a startup uh, which has been a decade, uh, uh, decade now in the, uh, in the startup field. Uh, and we started off with the first digital transformation of agriculture. And then now we launched, uh, last year we launched the crop in air labs and also the uh, world's first intelligent agri-cloud. <clears throat> so it's been a quite a bit of journey and I'll take you through that whole process as well. We have like multiple uh, applications that we talk about. So when we talk about AI, there is not a, only about the models and the solutions and everything. We should think of it as a system, uh, which also we shouldn't forget that data becomes a very important piece. You know? Dr. Lee talked about simulations, uh, you know, DFTs and experimentals. Uh, so in agriculture as well, there is also, you know, data is very precious. So we do have like our own database where we store data. Um, and that's across the globe, you know, so it's not only uh, only Indian-based uh, data. We have to talk about global data as well, because when we talk about models and model building, we can't be specific only to a specific location or geography. Uh, then, you know, you are really distributing your samples to only one specific uh, set of samples, right? So, so we did also the data hub that we built, which is accessible, you know, through APIs. And some of our intelligence uh, tools are available also through API calls. And there is apps, uh, app layer, which those who are interested, they can also have access to, right? Um, uh, we did have like, uh, you know, we have brought many models to production. So when we talk about model building, it's not just theoretical and experimental in nature. We have like uh, now over 50 models that we have actually brought into production. This is some of them. Uh, you know, uh, so, you know, I've been an academic researcher and also in industry. Uh, I'm very happy to share that often bringing models into production is not easy because you never know when it will fail. And I'll share some ideas also on what actually we have been able to get, uh, you know, because having that 90, 95% accuracy on a certain amount of data set, I think these days most people can accomplish that. But how do you actually bring that scalable and it works also and reliably, right? That's a very important piece as well that uh, we'd have to tackle. So right now, like across the globe, uh, you know, not only in terms of the number of uh, farms that we have actually handled and the number of farmers that we have handled, but also there is a lot of diversity. Just like you can have face related diversities, you can also have crop related diversity, you know, like uh, what is endemic and specific to Korea uh, is very different than what is endemic and specific to 
uh, India or South America or Europe um, or Australasia. Right? Um, so we have brought all of these different models to production and they are functioning very well. Um, we have had like a lot of learnings in the past. It was not an easy journey. Um, and it's been like over iterative process. What I want to spend some time today, uh, that's a little bit about Propin. Uh, we, most of our uh, solutions are available on the cloud. We have very strong partnership with uh, the Amazon Web Services, AWS, and also with Google Cloud and some of the technical partnership. Uh, Kropin is, uh, you know, the first investors who came in was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. After that, we have had a series of investors and recently uh, Google being our pre-series D uh, investor as well. Now, what I want to uh, talk about today is that uh, on regenerative and climate smart agriculture. So uh, at the end of the session, uh, I want to a little bit, uh, uh, you know, leave some food for thought as well, you know, if I may say so. Uh, and the idea is that this particular part, everyone, I would love that everyone in this forum uh, feel close to agriculture because it is an important part of our life, you know, not only, and I'll also leave you with some thoughts on why it is important to have regenerative and climate smart agriculture, right? Um, so food production affects us all. What food we have on our table is, you know, it's very important for us to know where that comes from, right? Uh, what kind of chemicals or inputs have been used, you know? If I give you a list of inputs that has gone into the food which is cultivated, would you, would you still uh, purchase that, you know? So consumers want transparency in, uh, in food, but not only that, it also has a significant effect on our climate as well. So we are trying to actually like, uh, you know, handle multiple things is that uh, food production itself can have uh, methane, I mean, methane and carbon dioxide emissions, right? And it's important for us to reduce that. So it should not become a contributor and increase the environmental footprint in carbon. But on the contrary, it can actually be a major source of sink also of carbon, right? So that's the first thing. And Believe me or not, the farmers, the poor farmers of the world, uh, you know, which are probably the larger neglected sector, uh, they are actually climate warriors, even as you speak, you know. When you talk about climate smart agriculture, <clears throat> you can't remove regenerative agriculture because it should go in hand in hand, you know. For some part of the world, food production is, food security is an issue, but other parts of the world, most of this part of the world, sustainability and regenerative agriculture is most important, you know. So this is from FAO. And for those who are interested, uh, you know, there is an article that I wrote on earth.org. Uh, so I would recommend if you would like to read, uh, and this is uh, on climate smart agriculture as well, you would find <clears throat> some interesting ideas there. Uh, I don't know if uh, this one, uh, I'm going to give it a try. Um, so this is uh, one of our uh, work. It's Due to global climate change, the planet is experiencing extreme and unpredictable weather conditions, which are posing as a threat to Indian agriculture because our farming practices are heavily reliant on seasonal patterns. Sadly, there's no pattern anymore. Our age old knowledge is irrelevant. The only way to farm now is to inspect every crop every single day to add to their struggle. Farmlands in India are spread over distances of 20 kilometers, making everyday monitoring humanly impossible. Lays partners with 27,000 farmers to procure potatoes, which means their problem is our problem. So to solve this, Lays collaborated with Cropin and leading satellite agencies to create Smart Farm. A SAS platform that uses satellite imagery and remote sensing to build an early warning system. We have trained the AI with data from the last four years of over 3,000 hectares of lace contract farms. By overlaying live satellite image onto historical data combined with weather and time, it analyzes factors that affect growth patterns of the crop. For instance, the variation in green indicates the intake of nitrogen. Gradients of yellow show signs of water stress. Unevenness of crop indicates signs of 
processes, among many more. We simplify all this information for the farmer as color codes and share it as an early warning to their smartphones. It captures every detail. It even recognized that I had a faulty sprinkler. It detected early signs of blight disease and warned me seven days in advance. This tells them where and what human intervention is needed. With this technology being open to us, even the next generation that didn't want to farm will now come back to farm. Not only does it make farming like proceed, but credits from planners ensures financial stability of farmers and will create food security for generations to come. If you solve for India, you can solve for any developed country and we have seen this. A partnership that we did with uh, Lace with PepsiCo. Uh, this actually won the Can uh, Lion Awards uh, this year. Uh, I'll just very briefly talk about uh, you know. So we we talked about the database of data that we have across the globe. Uh, so we use that to train our models. So now, <clears throat> obviously, deep learning and transformers have uh, uh, become uh, really fashionable. But no, our models need not necessarily have that. What we have found is. Uh, subject matter experts, you know, combined with, uh, you know, machine learning models actually perform much better than, uh, you know, uh, some of the other models. But there are certain use cases where definitely we need, uh, you know, uh, either uh, some of these uh, deep uh, neural networks or transform based models. You know. So one such application is to identify, uh, you know, what kind of crops are growing in a land. So firstly, what we do is we download Sentinel data. We uh, uh, Sorry, the European Space Agency's uh, satellite data, which is called the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. And then we actually like train some models on top of, uh, you know, if we know actually like what is growing in a particular farm, we can actually like uh, use that to train our models. And we build actually, we can uh, detect crop, we can estimate yield stages of the crop, what stresses they have, you saw in the video, right, all of that. Now, this is how uh, I'll not go into the details, but this is how the framework uh, looks like, you know, uh, we can, uh, the first stage is if you have any satellite image, there can be, uh, you know, lots of things that could be happening there, you know, there could be a water body, there could be a land, which is being cultivated, there could be an urban space, there could be grasslands, there could be um, other others as well, right? Uh, now, what is important is to actually first identify what is growing there, you know, uh, which area is agricultural area and then finding out what is growing, right? So for that uh, is where we use this deep learning model. We, we are able to do it also uh, throughout the season, you know, uh, uh, in specific uh, periods of time. It's a very, very hard problem because, uh, you know, the crop itself is very diverse and there are a lot of varieties, you know. Uh, we have now actually like done, and then we do the yield estimation. We can do what stage it is, what uh, you know, what the health is, and things that you know we can determine. Uh, we have done this across the globe, and this is the map of uh, you know what has happened across uh, uh, not only in India. In India, we have done for twenty seven major countries, but then twenty seven major crops. But we have done it in Japan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, the U.S., you know, uh, Brazil. You know, and I think a few other maps are recently we also did for Kenya and Nigeria, and I'll actually little bit talk about that. <clears throat> so once we do the crop identification, we can actually now overlay further intelligence on it. We can determine soil moisture, for example. What we see here is, uh, you know, two uh, satellite images from 2021 and 2022 in Glen County in uh, US, you know, which is actually known for rice cultivation, paddy cultivation. And uh, actually, this pink area is where we, you know, we have overlaid on top of the Google uh, satellite image, our own crop identification. We found that in 2021, this area is having paddy cultivation, but this area doesn't have any more, you know. <clears throat> and we attributed uh, to the loss in, uh, you know, for example, this was drought uh, season, almost drought season in uh, California. And so the uh, water a paddy is very highly water consuming. So there was, you know, those farmers who used to grow rice cultivation, 
they stopped growing, you know, and you can see that the land has also been kept bare, and you can see that from the satellite images, you know. But you have to do this at scale also, you know. Now, uh, paddy is not only water consuming, but it's possible to reduce the amount of water. But it also, during specific stages of the crop, uh, it can actually lead to methane emissions also. This is in Italy region, Novaro region. I've also added some of my collaborators here, uh, Fabio and Ajay, who used to work on this. You can see that there are, uh, you know, uh, paddy regions where methane emissions we are detecting, you know, methane plumes, right? Uh, so this is also based on our uh, further analysis. So we identified the paddy growing regions and then saw with uh, hyperspectral images, what is uh, those regions which are affected with uh, methane emissions. So, you know, if we do better management practices, it's possible to reduce the amount of methane that is getting emitted from paddy fields also. This is a challenge across the globe. You know? uh, now, I want to a little bit talk about uh, shift gears and talk uh, also in Kenya, for example. So we talked about uh, methane emission studies, you know, um, and uh, effect of climate change on rice cultivation itself. Uh, now, this is a study area that we did in Kenya. For example, Kenya, you, this is the, <clears throat> the ASAL map that has been released. That means uh, regions where there is uh, arid and semi-arid lands. Uh, yellow means like it's stress, red means uh, it's emergency famine condition, you know. This is, uh, you know, a map of classification just for a few years back. But we did uh, some studies this year, you know, anomaly studies, and this is done by us. And we found that certain regions, which are maize growing regions, like, uh, you know, West Pokot region, Baringo region, you know, uh, Lakipi, uh, Lakipia regions, you know, these are having uh, precipitation rainfall anomalies, you know. Now we can go and study these regions as well, you know, so based on our own crop identification intelligence, what we found is that what you see here in the same Kenya region, you see that red is where the amount of hectares of land has reduced, you know, uh, it's reduced field, but this is the major growing area. Now, if you compare, this is 2018 data versus 2023 data, um, you see that this particular region, for example, you know, earlier it used to have uh, maize cultivation 2018, but it has actually shifted to this region. The reason is many of the uh, maize growing farmers have moved from here to the new region here. So they move from here to here because of lack of water. So they have also been migrating across, and this is Mandara County. They have been also uh, migrating across the different uh, the country border also, searching for water, you know. We also found that uh, in particular uh, maize growing region uh, in called Uwasin Gishu, production dropped by more than nine percentage, you know, in uh, in many of these counties compared to 2018, you know. So this is, and this we actually attribute to extreme drought-like conditions, so especially we are looking at this, uh, you know, drought indices. I will not go into the details of it. 2023 was especially a, a very difficult period. Regions where maize production was very high, you know, is that there, you know, the, <clears throat> we found that the precipitation is much lower than, uh, for example, if you look at 2019 or uh, 20, uh, 20 data, and there we found that almost 30 percentage drop in production uh, or 2023 to 2018. So these kind of analysis are also possible once we have done the crop identification and yield estimation, we can do the slicing and dicing of the data as well. Uh, this is one particular, and I'll just finish with this on climate smart agriculture. Uh, this is one particular data that we have on um, on uh, India, for example. This particular year, we found that uh, you know the mean temperature. This is what we the twenty year mean normals that we see. Particular period of time, February March, we found that the both the mean and the maximum temperature is much higher than. Uh, the uh, long-term normals, what we call the climate normals, you know, this actually led to loss in yield as well. We found especially wheat, mustard, potato farmers, you know, really affected uh, by this kind of extreme heat waves. So when there is some it's extreme heat waves, then there is in potato, you know, below the soil, there can be some necrosis, you know, like an these are very difficult to detect, you know, but if we know in advance that there is going to be this uh, uh, extreme weather, we, it's possible to put some 
some water and uh, you know cons and cons do cons some conservation of these potatoes as well so uh, in in summary climate uh, does affect a lot of the sowing uh, you know harvesting even the in season growing uh, for farmers right and doing these kind of analysis helps us in bringing policy makers you know i'll just touch upon one uh, last element on regenerative agriculture also regenerative agriculture there's a lot of discussion but the important thing is we are moving away actually from that conventional machinery based to you know regenerative agriculture where the importance is to put back things into the soil maintain the soil nutrients diversity of crops is important you know disturbance of soil is minimal we need to cover the soil keep it like minimize the amount of uh, you know inputs that we use fertilizers uh, and crop protection right so uh, the important thing is once we do that uh, you know it's automatically we are becoming climate resilient and also it's something good for the planet also so there are some studies that we did uh, now for example in india and uh, and other regions also stubble burning is a big issue uh, how we manage the residue of the crops right uh, so uh, I, as I mentioned, for example, crop lands could sequester a lot of uh, organic carbon. All of this should normally be put back into the soil. Um, so small scale landholders can account for even 28 percentage of absorption of atmospheric carbon dioxide and putting it into their uh, into their crops and putting it, pushing it back to the soil. But what happens is uh, due to climate uh, change, between two seasons, there is uh, between the wet season and dry season, there is very less amount of time. So the, it leads to crop residue burning, you know, the residues are burnt away rather than put back into the soil, you know. So this particular uh, study that we did was in Punjab region. Uh, we had like a lot of data sets that we took from Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 and MODIS. Um, what we found is that using, uh, you know, using hyperspectral data, it's possible to, you know, you see that this is within the growing season from 2019 June to 2020. You see that this particular area, there is some residue and we've detected this residue using machine learning. And then it's possible to know like where all the fires are happening, you know, so this can actually, because of burning, what you're seeing in Punjab region, this is the maximum risk incidence of fires. Um, and it's now possible to detect that. This is a satellite image of a burning region. You can see that smoke is possible to detect. And not only that, that is also possible to find the burnt area. You know, This is the residue left after burning. You know, Like you can see that uh, there is a black residue you know, that is left behind. You can see the smoke still coming. Right? So this is the output of the machine learning algorithm. This is a field study that I did. Uh, this is an actual region which I visited where uh, farmers have left, burned this particular area. This was, uh, uh, I'd done this somewhere in early this year. Um, and you can see this area, right? Uh, it's there, it's getting, uh, uh, it's growing. Uh, and you see that as the time progresses, there, there is a harvest happen. And you see this is burning there it's completely burnt you know before the next season happens right um so it's possible to detect this i'll just uh, conclude with a couple of slides on where we are actually proceeding as well and i'll stop uh, my uh, my presentation uh, what uh, actually we have to do is um, right now we are moving towards task-based learning towards generalistic learning uh, even in the agriculture field also, geospatial uh, data is enormous. It's necessary to integrate all of that. There's a work that I did uh, on unsupervised learning as well. Uh, it's possible to detect uh, using unsup in an unsupervised way, uh, using uh, learning, learning just the representations, of this, which are the regions which are having different types of uh, land usage, like water body, roads, vegetation, everything. This is the TSNE plot. Uh, I'll not go into the details of it, but this is not uh, labeled data, you know, this is learned automatically. Um, even in the satellite data, it's possible now to have generic models, which we have also done. We have built some foundation models uh, based on convolution neural nets, but it's also possible to replicate that for transformers as well. Just like you have vision transformers and language transformers that works, uh, we are also seeing that it's possible in satellite data combined with in situ and ground data, to move towards generalistic model, which can become task independent 
and it can be used for multiple different kinds of uh, tasks uh, like i talked about stubble burning crop detection land use land classification deforestation and things like that you know so our group is planning to release that sometime very soon and i request you to stay tuned to that uh, if you're interested in collaborating or anything, uh, please do, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is pravinpankaj at ieeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
so what kind of panorama we can see so through these arrows. But for cars with the GPS location, we can show the directions. However, in this case, this is just an image, image that's taken by a person and it's uploaded. That is why we were not able to have these arrows. So in this server where we have a lot of images, we can create panorama and see the rela relation between the first panorama and the second panorama and where the third panorama is, we can create a graph. And so that is what that team done. So this is called the large scale computer vision system. So we have images and we are able to find the relationship between those images. And this is currently being provided as a service even these days. And then in 2018, I was on sabbatical year and uh, no, I was actually on a research term in Microsoft. And this is called the cross-platform device localization. So for those of you who have children, you would know about the game Minecraft. And so this Earth service is like creating a Minecraft kind of a structure in this environment where we live in and do the game. And so you can see everyone has their own mobile phone where there's a camera and they can see the same common model. And to do so, people need their mobile phones or they need to have these HoloLens devices of Microsoft so that the camera can recognize the location and the space of the environment and through computer alg algorithm, the localization is possible. So I've been doing that at Microsoft for about a year and then I came back to Korea. And since then, starting 2015, I've been working a lot on 3D information, how to acquire 3D information quickly and in a cheap way. So I've been thinking about all the ways how to do it. And so in terms of computer vision, to find the depth of the image, because in image, we don't really know the distance. So to find out the distance and the easiest way is to do stereo matching. So using the right eye and left eye, the, dif the distance is different that is perceived by both eyes. And so considering that disparity, we can calculate the distance and through using the computer it can be even more accurate and so for people or humans 114 degrees is the field of view of both eyes and we can recognize the 3d vision others we can just recognize the blur image so rabbits for instance they have a wider field of view and so the area is very wide that they can perceive but then the overlap is only about 10 degrees and so I did a combination so that for 360 degrees I wanted to do the sensing of all the 360 degrees and so that is why I have come up with this ultra wide FOV lens so when you look at this fish eye lens it actually covers 180 degrees for cars but then this one can also cover even up to 250 degrees so if we would locate the car in this way, then the cars can see left and right and can see 360 degrees. So this is the kind of setup that we've worked on and we wanted to realize 360 degrees omnidirectional depth estimation. And so the advantage of depth or 360 degrees depth is maybe people would say LIDAR, but the biggest problem of LiDAR sensor is that it is very expensive. It is much more expensive than cameras. And another challenge is because one point will have to sense all 360 degrees. So there are occlusions and there are parts where the depth cannot be calibrated. And so these days uh, we use a lot of LiDAR sensors. But what we're suggesting is that we will be using cameras that will be installed on the body itself. And so from the top, there is no occlusion and without occlusion, we can get the depth image of the 360 degrees image. And so the challenge is that we need to use the fish eye lens. And so there's a lot of distortion. And because we have to process all that 360 degree image, so there's a lot of overhead to be calculated. And sometimes this part shows something completely different from the other one. So we need to address these challenges in order to use these cameras. So basically, there are four cameras and the images that will be received. Let's see, we have this virtual screen and you can see that depending on the distance, when the projection is done like this and then the image will be aligned at some point. But if it goes further away, then there will be some occlusion. So we will be analyzing and we'll be testing the depths that we received with the images. And then we will be creating this 3D point cloud. And by doing so, we have carried out our research. 
And so this is the platform or algorithm that we eventually created. This is the deep neural net. So I don't think you can see the point. And so once we receive the images through the, CN, the GNN, we can extract the features, and then we do the spherical sweeping, and then we find the matching points. And sometimes it doesn't match accurately. So there is cost volume computation where we see the surrounding environment through the neural network. And then this is the direction, the latitude and the longitude, and see where that object is. It will be shown in red point. And so if we see the red dots and extract that information, we will get the depth map and image. And so with that, we can create panorama image, the point cloud as well. So this is the solution that we developed. And so, as you can see on the on the left side, there is this helmet kind of a camera. And with that, if we use the neural network, then we get the 360 degrees depth map. And we can use it as 3D coordinates and we will get point clouds. And so we can see what structures there are next to the structure that I've taken the image of. And we will, we've used the LIDAR together. And this, I think the LIDAR costs about 6 million Korean won. This is the 16 channel LIDAR. And the colors in rainbow, these are the dots received through LIDAR. LIDAR gives us the exact distance. However, the field of view is very narrow. And, but what we can do is that we cover a wider view and the distance is not so much, you know, less accurate compared to LiDAR. So until now, we've been, you know, calibrating the distances. But if somebody carries the camera and moves around, then it is also necessary to calculate the movements of the car or the person holding the camera. And just by having the lens, we can calculate the distance of how much that car or person has moved. And because we have a 360 degrees uh, image taking system, we need to solve the image distortion effect. But so there is the number one camera and number two camera. So we have to do the feature matching well so that we can do the projection of the image and match the features appropriately and find the relevant camera motions. This is the algorithm that we developed. So you can see the input is the same. So in the before we tried to find the distance and now we are trying to match the features, the movements of the object, we're calculating it in order to find out the location of the camera. So we're looking at the trajectory. We can reconstruct the trajectory of the camera. So this is the system that we developed. And so if we combine the that we know the distance of the camera and as well as the location of the camera, then what we get is the point clouds that we get from each and every camera. So we would know the eventual structure, the environment. And then with because it's hard to just use only the point clouds, so we can create this kind of a mesh board. And so because we know the distance that the camera is looking at, so we use this 3D modeling and then we get an idea of that overall model or the environment. So this is the maxi model. So this is the live reconstruction that is currently being done. And I've mentioned that the trajectory will be calculated in the way that I explained before. And then the depth is also calculated. And by doing so, we can construct the 3D mesh model to do the 3D modeling. And then we have further developed the system. <coughs> Using that same input video, we get the depth, we get the trajectory, we do 3D modeling, and then you can see the mesh model again. And so scanning a six floor building takes about only seconds, and then processing takes about one hour, and then you get this mesh model. And this is what we created. And we have a, we are working, we have a startup that is working on this field. And Robot navigation is another thing that we do. So I said that we wanted to apply these sensors to robots and to cars. Instead of using those expensive lighters, we can use more of the cameras. That is why on top of the robot platforms, we had installed four cameras and have also installed a computer and to do the processing. So we have 
use the robot to do the scanning of this entire environment, the office. And so it will capture images of the furniture. It's like LiDAR. The performance is as good as LiDAR. And so we have also created the mesh model as well. So based on the model, it's at a primitive level. We've applied it to autonomous driving. So in this platform called MOS, and we can use LiDAR, and that kind of a package is provided. But in our case, we have excluded LiDAR. We have added our system, and we have checked whether we can see any hurdles that are in front of the robot or the agent. And we can also find out the location of the robot as well through our calibration model. And right now, the motion is a bit unnatural. Sometimes the agent stops or goes again, but we try to optimize the movement again so that this robot can, in the end, become a delivery robot with natural movements. And I've mentioned about the 3D modeling. And because the mesh model doesn't really have good quality, but this one is the neural network rendering where we have the input data, the image that we create, that we received, and then the depth that we have calculated will be coded to the camera. <clears throat> and it's like we can get the depth map. And this is the color coding. And using this, we have done the neural network training. And this is the output that we get. And what we did is that we have connected the camera trajectories and we have done the query of the continuous images. So this is the outcome. So this is just like taking a video of a room. So the machine or the agent did a good learning. And below you can see the distance as well. So the distance as well as the length as well as the surface of that environment. So we can extract all that information through the agent and we can also create a mesh model as well. So this one is much more accurate, much more, uh, much better than the one that we did before. And so we are trying to expand this technology and what we're doing is to apply it to a larger space, to capture a larger space. And this is what we've done in summer last year because we, our company is at within the Hanyang University. There is a park and this is a hip place. And so we wanted to capture all this area. However, when you go to Naver Street View, you will be able to see that there is this hip street in front of a another university, but those small streets are not captured. But because we can walk around having our computers, uh, having our cameras, so we can capture all those tiny little bits and pieces of the little streets. And so through the SLAM algorithms, we can see the trajectories and we can reconstruct the path that this person has been going. It was about 15 kilometers. So we have the SLAM map, we have the image data as well. And so all the rendering is feasible through everything that we have. And this has been done together with a public agency, government agency called the HD map, which is in order to create ADAS, you need to have a map, but for map, you only see the roads, but here we see the signboards, we see the lights, traffic lights. But until now, that HD map was captured through the LiDAR and camera, so it's very expensive. And we call it the MMS car, and it costs about 500 million Korean won. So updating all those programs was very expensive, inconvenient. So what we suggested is to have a rooftop, have four high resolution cameras on the rooftop of a car to capture the images and scan the roads. And then eventually we can do the reconstruction of the roads in 3D, capture the traffic lights and the signboards as well, which can be done in a less expensive way. And lastly, I would like to talk about that we cannot, we not only see the images of this model, but using the model, using the image and the the image, we can do the localization. We can do visual localization or location recognition. So this is something that we've done with our mobile phone camera, and. We would match the input and the model, and you can see this small green dot. 
and this is the location and direction of the person. And so the yellow point is the one that matches the person, and we can see the green point that we have reconstructed through calibration. Of course, there are some errors as well, but in most cases, we are accurate in doing the location recognition. Just with the image, we can see where we are. And this technology is currently being developed. So I've mentioned about the neural net that we can do the reconstruction and that we can also construct a 3D map and we can apply it to AR, VR and cars. And we are currently developing technologies. This will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Professor, for the fruitful presentation. Thank you once again to all of the speakers of panel at session two for your insightful presentations. And now we will take a short moment to rearrange the seats for the panel discussion. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before we begin the panel discussion, let me first introduce the chair of session two. We have Dr. Hwasop Lim, the head of the Center for Artificial Intelligence at Korea Institute of Science and Technology. So Mr. Lim will moderate the panel discussion for session two. Please give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I am Im Hwa Sop. I am the uh, head of the Korea Institute of Science Technology Center for Artificial Intelligence. So today's theme may be difficult, but it's something that a lot of people have interest in and are curious about. And I am also personally curious about the evolution of AI too. So human, AI, and robots Will we be able to collaborate or is there going to be a dystopian future as we see in the movies often? So let's have a candid discussion about this. So don't just talk about the ideas that, you know, science, scientific development is going to be good for human beings. Let's be honest and frank. So other than the three presenters, we have two more panelists today. So I will let them briefly introduce themselves. First, Professor Goyle is joining us. Five minutes. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me as a panelist for this. So, thanks, Dr. Lee and Dr. Kim for uh, putting me on the dais here. So, I am Dr. Pawan Goyal, a faculty member in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Kharagpur. And I have been working in the area of natural language processing and deep learning for the last 10 years. And my primary interest is in the field of NLP, natural language processing, developing systems that can solve problems that are of relevant to the society. So over the last few years, we have actually worked extensively in various areas that are of relevance to the society. For example, we work on the field of using Twitter for disaster management. That during disasters when there are a lot of people who are needing help and there are messages coming on social media, how do we use that through the, through the NLP techniques to actually connect them with the agency that would give me, uh, yeah, that would actually uh, help the people, right? So how do we connect them? How do we summarize the information? How do we collect the information? How do we summarize the information? So that was one of the works that we had started. Then we also worked on legal domain. That, <clears throat> again, in legal domain, there's a lot of uh, interest in the field of artificial intelligence, that how you can use AI to actually find out for a layman like like, like me, whenever I'm, I have a particular legal need, what are the relevant uh, sections that are of importance to me. For a law practitioner, 
given a case, what are the precedent cases that would be of relevance to me? So how do I build solutions for them? And, and recently we have also started working in the field of health domain, that is, especially in a country like India, when you have a lot of uh, hospitals and there's always a scarcity of human resources. How do, how do we use AI, in particular robotics and uh, language and image processing to bridge the gap so that we can also take this, uh, we can also do things like detecting whether uh, a person has received medication on time. Simple things, but can we use AI techniques to, to ensure standard protocols in the, in the medical domain? And yeah, I'm also thankful that uh, we have been collaborating with IKST for last few years and have worked on the field of AI for material, material science, both in the field of natural language processing, how do we extract information from research articles in material science, and also how do we develop modules that can do property prediction for crystalline materials that Dr. Lee was presenting in his, in his talk. So yeah, overall this the panel topic is very, very interesting and very, very important. And yeah, thanks again for uh, letting me part of this discussion. I'm looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mr. Kim here as a panelist. Hello, it's a great honor to be a part of the 2023 Seoul SNT Forum. My name is Song Soo Kim. I'm the founder and CEO of Data Crunch. And also, so I'm a founder of Data Crunch Global. And it has been eight years since I have founded this company in 2016. And I am also an adjunct professor at School of International Studies at Hanyang University. So I think I have a very peculiar or special background because I am a founder of a business. And also, I do like engineering and tech company. I own a company, and also I have a PhD too. So I think I could have a I could share my comprehensive view for this panel. Thank you for inviting me. So the theme of today's panel discussion is humans, AI, and robots. Will we be able to collaborate and coexist? So I'm going to ask several questions in this under this theme. So to briefly uh, introduce myself, so I am expanding my area of expertise. Uh, so actually, my you know childhood dream was to create a Terminator. So I was wondering what I should study. And so that is why I studied computer vision and robotics. So ultimately, so will the robots be able to act and coexist like humans? Will, so I think I dreamt of robots being able to feel what humans could feel too. And I think we are headed that way in some aspect. So I had, that was my childhood dream, but I didn't really think that this vision will be realized so soon because in 2005, you know, the Kurzweil published a book saying that the singularity will come pretty soon. And then, you know, the, and then there was other, you know, subsequent publishments afterwards, but I didn't really think that it's going to happen in 2030. You know, AlphaGo won over Isedol in Playgo, but it's a specific area. And in order for a robot or AI to be able to function like AI in multiple fields, I think maybe 2050, if lucky, not 2030. And in my area of expertise too, so we do CNN, which is like the foundation for deep learning. So when it was first launched in 2012, it was still, you know, AI had strength in a very specific area, not like a multiple areas of human life. But then the transformer model was launched and then it started to understand the, the natural languages. So we do it. People say that AGI is going to soon be, you know, publicly used. 
So from that perspective, I have uh, prepared several questions. So I, science te technology so far, I think, was used to do something that humans cannot do. For example, making planes, you know, making or, you know, uh, you know, flying or used in like engines of cars. But if, for example, humanoids or AGI, you know, they were created to replace human intelligence. So then if this evolves, then maybe AI or humanoids may be able to replace humans. So I, cr I uh, prepared six questions with that as a background. It may be difficult, but I do think that this panel discussion is going to be quite interesting because the presenters and the panelists are from various aspects, various fields. So I think it'll be very interesting to hear what they think about my questions. So, you know, it's going to take too much time to, you know, take turns for all of the six questions. So I would like, I will take two volunteers to answer each question. So first one, so, you know, we have researchers here and businessmen in this room also. So during the process of R&D and during the process of product development, people are, you know, using a lot of AIs. And then this AI technology, if it keeps evolving, then are you going to keep on using human workforce or are you going to use AI instead? Or in terms of R&D and product development, if AI is so good, then do you, will you still need human workforce? Would anybody like to answer this? Okay, so I am a core scientist, so I would like to share my view. So actually, uh, it was a difficult question, but come to think about it, I don't think, I think AI will be assistant, not replacing humans, because in the 19th, hundreds if AI was developed, if, you know, if we assume, then with the theory of relativity or special theory of relativity have been devised? I don't think so. So it means that the AI is not so sophisticated to create those theories. So therefore, AI will be assistance to humans. But then, in terms of the scalability of the human knowledge, you know, there's been a lot of development there. But thanks to AI, the knowledge level will be uh, leveling up. And accordingly, I think the scientists need to develop more systems to cater for that. And then I want to hear from, so I've, we've heard from a researcher, so now I would like to hear from a businessman. Um, I forgot what the name was, I'm sorry. Uh, Praveen or uh, Songsu Kim, would you like to answer the question, please? So it's a very interesting question. So I'm a businessman and I'm a, I operate a tech company. We you know, develop and market products. And if you think about how those technologies can be used, well, I think, you know, if the decision making is not so difficult, I could leave it to the technology. If you go to the Tesla factory, you know, it's, there's not many people there, only except for two areas. One is the inspection side. The inspection must be done by humans. And second is where the process is too much in detail. So it's difficult, like for example, coiling, it's too difficult and too detail a job for the machine to do. And it's all relevant with skills. So I think whether the machine can be accountable for the performance is an important factor. So I think for the relatively unmaterial jobs could be, uh, could be uh, uh, left for the machines, but those that require a lot of sophistication needs to be done by humans. If you look at the history of innovation, I mean, science starts from imagination and then it leads to discovery. And, you know, remember Galileo said, you know, it's actually the earth that is revolving. And actually that was 
uh, a statement in his imagination first, which he proved to be true. So I think everything starts from innovation, and I think science technology develops from that. And so we need to imagine. And that imagination needs to happen out of the samples that we already have. And so I think that imagination is the realm of human beings, not machines. So that is why I think humans still are necessary going forward. So then something pops up in my mind. AI keeps on developing, and I think there was some similar idea that imagination is, a, is something that only humans can do, so therefore humans cannot be replaced by AI. But if you think about it, but a lot of jobs that used to require imaginations are being replaced by AIs, like designing, um, you know, writing. You know, AI is replacing a lot of authors and creators, right? So maybe we need to think about that. Now I would like to give my second question. So it's not about the product development. We're looking at the final product. So if AI is the product of the process, so if AI is the actual output, then would that mean that AI is replacing humans or assisting humans? So um, Praveen? I would like to hear from you what you think. Yeah. <clears throat> Respected panel members, and Chair. <clears throat> so I have a couple of points. Um, it's, it's definitely is a difficult question. I'll, I'll give a stab at it. <clears throat> um, you know, it, do I, so the, my primary objective, at least as, I mean, I'm a scientist and also at the same time, I come from the industry, so I have I also, like Dr. Lim, wear these two hats, if I may say, both academic and industry. What I believe is that, uh, uh, you know, over a period of time, uh, the AI systems, it should develop to enhance human intelligence itself. You know, the way <clears throat> that I see it is, um, you know, I mean, while it's helpful for many tasks, when we become too much dependent on it, uh, I do have some interest in cognitive science also, neuroscience. It can affect our normal cognitive functions also. Like for example, too much dependence on, let's say on particular task-based uh, you know, organization can lead to our own losing of our own cognitive memory. You know, uh, you often see, right? Like navigation, right? We depend on maps for navigation. Now, earlier we used to be able to navigate without using maps, uh, but now our sense of there is a particular part of the brain which is responsible for long-term memory and also for ability to navigate. That is reducing in human beings, you know. So one thing I think we should think of for the future of humanity is how we should probably look at AI as assistive technology, but for human cognitive enhancement, you know, rather than just helping us with tasks, you know, so, and in that way, we can actually help improve the quality of life, you know. Uh, and I also agree with Dr. Uh, uh, Lim also on the fact that uh, when we're talking about uh, AI, um, you know, and, and humans, there is, uh, with respect to research and also with respect to product development as well, the outside of uh, the data samples, what allows human beings to express themselves uh, in that Eureka moment, as we call it, uh, is this ability to be intuitive. You know, sometimes it's really out of the box thinking, but that out of the box thinking really comes from human intuition, you know. Uh, be it from, uh, you know, uh, let's say the uh, Fullerene, you know, those who are coming from uh, chemistry and uh, Buckminster Fullerene, you know, this uh, ball which was, or, or benzene, you know, where the scientist actually sees a snake, uh, you know, coiled around and where he kind of creates this uh, structure of the benzene ring. Uh, that actually comes from intuitive, you know, so I think it's neuroscience itself has not explored this. Uh, aspect of human element, element of intuition, but I believe that uh, intuition and imagination can be a very powerful thing for human beings also. That's a little bit the take long answer, but 
I hope I answered the question. Thank you. And so, Mr. Lim, you've worked hard about, you've worked a lot about your technology, and you've also talked about the 3D modeling, about the automated 3D modeling technology. So, do you think that your technology will not replace humans? No. Well, You've talked about the steam turbine, the engine before when 100 people were necessary, now only one person is necessary. So maybe this will be like the change that we will be seeing. It's sad, but this will be the trend. And with the development of AI, I believe the roles of humans will be shrinking. Of course, there will be engineers who need to train the machines and AIs. However, for the ordinary people, I think a lot of work will be replaced by AI. However, let's say if people are scientists, engineers, then f them also. Well, so among us, we say that there aren't many papers that we like to read because when we do neural net, there's a lot of data. And if we do the learning well, then we can get better, better performance with the algorithm. So then it's about acquiring data, about getting that computational power. And so this is the game about that. And you mentioned about imagination, about intuition. And now we need to find those issues that are not resolved yet. So we need to provide ideas. I think this is this will be the main role of us. But then until when will this be feasible? Because we have this great system in place already and students are lazy to learn because you now I'm a professor so students don't want to learn hard as much as they did before. In the past they had to learn the formulas, they had to learn a lot, their own studies, they had to understand first to get to the next level. But nowadays because there are so many toolkits, so many systems, they can go to the next level without understanding the subject itself. So it's not about the students, it's also about the professor professors as well. So I think we're in that kind of a atmosphere. It's more like a transitional period. We're experiencing pretty much the same. So I think the importance of humans, well, I believe will only be greater if they learn more and they have this capability more. And as you said, yes, we need to be honest. We need to be frank. Yes, there is AI, but creativity of humans is important. Maybe someday not humans will be, you know, less competitive than AI. So we need to think about that. And that is why it's not that we want to just talk about this gloomy future, but we need to understand AI better so that we can dream of a brighter future. And this is, I think, linked to what you said earlier. And we talk about open AI, about Google, Meta, about having this common AI being developed. And so, for instance, the GPT-4, it recognizes a voice, text, and everything. And so it can do pretty much a lot. And so these common AI models that will be released through those large tech companies. Do we have to follow those trends? I believe you're facing a lot of difficulties and challenges. So this is like common AI, but then there will be specialized fields, let's say, where they need to have domain expertise. And so we need to, is it really necessary to develop those areas that need domain expertise? Anyone who would like to provide an answer? I could give it a shot. Oh, oh. Uh, Professor Goyal, do you think you have any answers that you would like to provide? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. I think, yeah, so this is a nice, uh, I mean, I won't say nice, this is a transition that we have seen in the last few years that there are a lot of pre trained models that have become available. Right, and many of them are not even uh, open source, and these are all models that can do multimodal, uh, that can be used for multimodal learning. So, one good thing is that now you don't have to worry about, I mean, 
learning a new field. Like I said, some I remember like ten years ago when people used to have they would do a problem for natural language processing. They would have to even know the details about the field, how to do feature engineering, and all. But but now one can just take a pretend model and and give a few examples, and this would work. This would give you the solution. Right? And, and now this has become common for multimodal inputs also. So you don't. So even if I'm a person who has not worked so much on in the image domain, yes, there are models available where I could use text and image together and videos and so on. Now one the but the thing that has happened is that because these models require a lot of compute, right? The, the companies who are, who are providing these models are typically big companies. So all these models that Blip model and Cosmos model, all of and GPT-4 and all, they are part of the big companies, right? So and suddenly it's a it looks in in some way it looks like a uh, even a threat to the to our profession that okay, so what are we going to do as a, as researchers or academicians when need so much compute and we can't compete with the with the large companies? At the same time, what I in our own research, what we have found that these models are actually giving us a very good starting point for trying to solve domain problems, right? So if I have to now start solving a problem in health domain, I don't have to worry so much about making the model understand the general language, the general uh, uh, images. It knows that I need to now adapt that model for the particular domain. And that's where getting the domain expertise, right? Little bit of domain expertise, how do you put that through maybe your prompts through your examples, right? Has become, it's becoming very, very relevant uh, recent times, especially for the startups, I would say. Startups, now they are able to take these models very easily. And once they have a new idea in mind, they can apply these models and, and get to a very good solution. And this time has reduced a lot. How much time do you really need to build up a solution? Uh, that would be my opinion, thanks. 그 지금 질문이... Well, so I used to ask this to the researchers. So if you ask a question to GPT, and if GPT says something that you don't understand, then you are less than average. So this is what I say to the students a lot or researchers a lot. So it means that the GPT has like average level knowledge about everything. And it means that you need to have more knowledge than that in order for you to survive. So I say this to a lot to the researchers. So, but actually, you know, it is really difficult for us to uh, supersede that level. But I guess that is what we need to try a more harder. So we have experts here, but if we think about the general public, <coughs> you know, in many cases, we don't really, the general public does not need very specific or expert knowledge. So if AGI is in the market, then maybe, you know, you know, simple or repetitive work. Some people could be doing simple and repetitive work. Then will AGI replace these humans? And would that kind of practice be accepted? And if somebody's doing If a human does the work better than AGI, well, if AGI does the work better, are you still going to hire people instead of AGI? I think it was a very important question. So, so at the business site, will AI be used? So if you think about that first, well, a technology being applied and commercialized in you know, business side, I think there are three con con um, conditions. One is that whether there is a social consensus. Second, if the technology is complete enough. And third, when we use this technology, is it useful? Is it effective? So do you, does it make you more money, for example? So I think these are the um, dependencies for the a technology to be used. And if these technologies do replace people, then that will lead to uh, job losses, right? But so I guess it 
although the technology is so good, sometimes it's not really deployed at the work site because there's resistance by these people because of potential job loss, I guess. And so you asked a question about replacement. So I would like to answer all to all the you know, subsequent questions too. So I guess there will be replacement, but would that actually lead to social uh, problems? I think we have to look back in the past. So when the combustion engine was still, or the steam engine was first developed, did, where did all the farmers go? You know, they remained where they were. And also when the telecommunications technology um, developed, then do we no longer use pigeons? Do we no longer use postmen? Not really. Actually, the telecommunications market grew and it became bigger. And so if you think about the automobile industry, you know, in the very remote places in the United States and late 19 centuries or the early 20s when the cars started to be spread, you know, people didn't like it because, you know, they said that, you know, these uh, city people brought cars into the rural areas and they stunned the um, horses. And so they call these cars the devil's wagon. And also in the newspapers, they used to feature articles saying that, you know, cars hit uh, little children, but actually so do horse wagons. <clears throat> so if we look back in the history, I think, you know, managing the opposition is very important. And we need to make the good judgment call. And well, the, I think what I want to say is this is something that we should think about. Think about the self driving cars, the autonomous cars. Then, if you don't have to drive, then what are you going to do during that time? You're going to either, you know, you could even play or sleep or study, right? You know, all of these activities, you know, all the human activities are economic activities. So the reason we drive is. Because, you know, the opportunity cost is higher when I drive than when I do not. So if a technology makes our life more comfortable and convenient, and if we do not have to, you know, work anymore, then the market dynamic will change. So, you know, Netflix, YouTube, I think. So before COVID, you know, if there were not the pan if the pandemic did not come, um, I don't think, you know, the spread of YouTube or Netflix would have increased that much because, you know, people actually did not have to go to work. So we, they saved time commuting and during that time they watched YouTube or Netflix because that is another form of activity, you know, economic activity, as I said earlier. So I think that is something that we need to understand that all the actions that humans do is an economic activity. And one other thing is that if this road is, you know, closed, it opens another door. I would like to recommend a movie called Hidden, 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 Figure. Hidden Figures. So there are these, you know, cashiers, you know, and when the, you know, the automatic cashier terminals were uh, adopted, then all these people became these computing experts. So it op opened new opportunities, job opportunities for these cashiers. So think about the internet search function, right? So, you know, before when internet searching, the portal sites were first introduced, you know, there, there were times where we actually applied for, you know, tests that I'm a good, uh, web searcher and we used to get accreditation from the government, right? So that was an older time. And I just want to say that, you know, new development leads to new opportunities. So that, you know, search uh, engine professional uh, accreditation disappeared, right? So maybe that was a disappearance of a job. So do you have any ide uh, ideas? Okay, I think I have a similar view. So we talk about the first and the second industrial revolution. So in case of these two industrial uh, revolutions, I think it expanded the muscle movement of the people. And and the third industrial revolution actually, you know, expanded, you know, the, the movement of the brains. So, you know, when the Excel spreadsheets were first launched in the 1990s, you know, a lot of people used like calculators back then and a lot of people, you know, lost their jobs because of the introduction of spreadsheets. Then, you know, 
at that time, you know, the job for the society was to shift jobs for them instead of leaving them just lose jobs. So now, all everything that we do is based on Excel spreadsheets, right? So I think going forward, AI will be like the very foundation skill for the office workers. So with that in mind, I think we need to think about job transition, tra jobs transfers. <laughs> So that reminds me of something that really moved me. So AI might not be replacing human beings right away, but <clears throat> those people who use AI are definitely replacing people who do not use AI. So I think this is something that we should think about. We only have about 10 minutes left, so I want to give my last question. So the title of the session is Humans, AI, and Robots. And so at the end of the day, AI will be, you know, mimicking or copying humans' uh, intellectual capacity, and definitely humanoid is designed to do that. So if AI plus in human intellect becomes real, then they will be able to do a lot of things, a lot more than what we think now. Then maybe, so... I heard that at the factories, the uh, material input is the only thing that cannot be replaced by robots. But if the robots have human intellect in the future, they will be able to do that too. So it means that humans really don't have to do anything and that will actually impact people's uh, income generation too. <coughs> So my last question is, you know, is something, so humanoid that has artificial intelligence, as we have seen in the movies, if that becomes real, then will they be able to coexist with humans? Or do you think, as we've seen in the movies, do you think AI humanoids will replace all the humans and then there's going to be like new, um, you know, caste system, for example? Do you, so do you think the future is going to be so gloomy? Does anybody uh, have any views that you would like to share? So development of AI, when I come to think of it, I think we started from something doing very easy and we're going to doing something very difficult and now with the computer vision and everything. So in the past, maybe this problem was not able to solve and now the neural network which mimics the human's brain and now can do so AI does much more better than just children doing let's say simple calculations and so I think there were some new findings there and so for instance the knowledge of people can be replaced by ChatGPT or any LLMs and so people's intelligence knowledge can also be summarized by AIs and this is the current phase and then the last phase would be the humanoid. Well, in the past, we've been doing a lot of research on robots and we thought that it will be quickly developed. However, in the physical world, I believe there's still time when we will see the emergence of humanoids and there are things, there are like sensors and actuators that has to be controlled. So this is the most difficult part, but eventually we will solve that problem as well. And then the society will change dramatically and it will be about how people will be receiving this new technology then this will be like an area of uh, society and politics and dr pan kayak san do you have any ideas or opinions about this question um i do agree um with the panel member um, is that uh, I think the current limitation is with respect to the sensors. I was thinking along the same lines as well. <clears throat> One other thing which uh, I would like to add is uh, that there needs to be currently some amount of governance also. I think like those who are involved in this field, uh, we appreciate that uh, we can't just let uh, the development happen in its natural pace without some amount of regulation, just like you have regulations for uh, drug discovery, the pharmacology, 
uh, and medicines and everything, some amount of regulatory process will still be required, you know, because of what kind of experiments can be done and what cannot experiments, what kind of experiments should not be done. Actually, it's, the word is should not because uh, very soon we will find that there is a limitation in the sensors, that means semiconductor based sensors that we can actually develop. And my greatest, uh, you know, uh, uh, concern would be when we actually start uh, moving into the realms of biological sensors, you know, uh, and integrating both of it. So then your humanoid starts not only mimicking humans, but becomes human-like in nature, right? So there is a genuine ethical concern on what kind of experiments can be done. Uh, within the realms of semiconductor industry and maybe the evolutions, as long as we can still keep it artificial, I think it's quite okay. Uh, if our humanoid starts having life of its own, then it's become difficult because it's hard to find the distinction between what is a human and what is a robot, you know. Um, and I think that we are seeing some experiments across the globe. So we just have to pay attention to that. But uh, I still, you know, having been in this research, being in the research, I'm still very much positive on what is could be accomplished. I would still like to believe that the enhancing of and of cognitive ability and uh, easing of the quality of life is something that we should target, uh, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, with respect to the other elements, I think there is definitely needs some amount of governance on what could or should not be done, you know, so, um, and uh, it can so happen that, uh, you know, currently all our computer vision models, language models, uh, even advances in robotics could be brought together and integrated. Uh, very soon we would actually see some intelligent humanoids, uh, but the limit should be with respect to uh, not using biological systems, you know, naturally occurring biological systems, which are, uh, you know, cellular based, you know, where then it starts having a life of its own, you know, so. So then lastly, I would like to ask Mr. Goya also for his opinion. Thank you. I think I, I do agree with the points that were made by both the panelists. Uh, at the same, yeah, at the same time, I mean, if you think that we are going to have humanoids in the future, responsible AI, ethical AI is, has a huge role to play. I mean, how do you ensure that you are deploying things in a responsible manner? So all those checklists would have to be worked out and how some technology like that can be deployed. At the same time, what kind of technologies it can actually be used in that can also be for example, limited, right? So there are, for example, students who do not get proper education. So it can actually open up a new field where the students can get personalized tutoring, right? So for example, humanists can actually serve as personalized tutors for so many students, right, in, in various countries. You can have personalized care for elderly, for especially in the hospital wards where you may not have uh, regular attendance to in a general work, but, you, but with the humanoids, you can actually try and achieve that goal. So there are many applications also where this could be beneficial to the society, right? So, but yeah, overall, I feel responsible AI and ethical AI has a huge role if uh, in some future we are going to see this. So, thank you. Is it good? So because we don't have that much time left, I would like to summarize about what has been sent. It is a very difficult issue. And for us as researchers, scientists, engineers, yes, we do have the desire to, you know, do this. We want to maybe create humanoids and we want to develop AIs. And it's maybe because of this desire of creating something that has not existed before. Maybe that's our desire. And also for the businesses and companies, maybe it's much more efficient to use robots instead of humans. That's why they want to embrace the technology better. 
but because of AI and people might think, people can think that workplaces will be replaced and they might be replaced. And so they will, I think, live a harder life even with the emergence of AI. So this, I believe that what has been said today about a humanoid with common AI, I think it will happen, but we need to have a social consensus being reached before that. And even if an AI or robot is superior, still, we have to be very cautious in using those AIs, like just we use a nuclear power plant. We have to be very cautious. There needs to be a lot of discussion before that. And because we are running out of time, Although, you know, you might be having much more, many more interesting opinions, but I think we should wrap up here. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again, everyone, the chair, the panelists, and the speakers for the insightful discussion. Please return to your seats. Thank you very much.